We'll start off with a talk from Alexander Gresh on energy estimation of quantum Hamiltonians using shadow grouping. Yes. Uh, okay. Hi. Uh, welcome back from the coffee break. Uh, thanks for tuning in for my talk. It's about the energy estimation problem of quantum many-body Hamiltonians. I'm one of those shadow guys, so thank you, Richard, for the shout out on Monday. Uh, I'm going to present joint work with Martin Klisch from the Techni Technical University of Hamburg. And to give you a motivation, I think the whole field is striving to find a practical quantum advantage. That is to say, an advantage which actually makes a difference for practical purposes. And for these practical purposes, for example, are believed to be in quantum chemistry or material science, we act, uh, effectively solve a diagonalization problem of uh, promising, I don't know, molecules or catalysators or so stuff like this. Um, for example, as an ansatz class, quant variational quantum algorithms, but we heard there were a lot of uh, limitations on them. There's also another more NIS uh, NISCI alter alternative, and these are analog quantum simulators um, as, a, as a perspective. For our purpose, they're all the same. They're effectively a black box, can be parameterized or not. Uh, so you apply this to some input state, and then you apply a measurement circuitry and uh, do a computational readout in the end. And we are not concerned with the black box. So in, in, in a sense, it doesn't matter if you give me a quantum algorithm or a quantum, a quantum simulator or any other uh, arbitrary device. We are just focused here on the measurement part uh, for this black box. Um, because this is already a challenge in itself, it's often referred to as the measurement, measurement bottleneck, um, because the problem is that uh, usually in these problems, or at least for this class of problems we are considering, the, the, you don't have uh, access to a direct measurement of the energy or other observables of interest, or to, or to like the correlators and so on. So you, this necess necessitates the use of measurement st strategies designed to the task. And secondly, you have to, of course, deal with shot noise because the measurement results from, your measure, from the measurements are probabilistic. And in particular, for example, in quantum chemistry, you really need high precision to guarantee that your result of your computation really gives you any, uh, uh, any result on the, from, the, for the, from the quantum chemistry perspective. And this already alludes to the fact that we really need many, many samples. And in principle, this can then really be a fundamental problem, even if you have had the ideal quantum co co computer that actually solves the task, um, this problem would still persist. Uh, to set the stage, I think this is what we are most used to as theoreticians. Um, for the experimental side, it's a black box, and you just basically press a button, and magically a quantum state appears. And here we use this, uh, so we are able to um, request single copies of a quantum state row which we then feed into a measurement device and then obtain, of course, the outcomes upon measuring it. Um, of course, in the task, there's also the Hamiltonian, right, because we want to do energy estimation of this state. So we decompose this, because we have qubit Hamiltonian, into the Pauli decomposition. And for this task I was alluding to, uh, they are efficiently decomposable. And then you're also usually you're given a finite measurement budget because you don't want to measure infinitely many often. In particular, we are considering the minimal hardware requirement, that is single qubit rotations and then a computational readout of your qubits. And effectively, this is, uh, boils down to these three different measurement types. These are measuring either the X, Y, or Z Pauli basis. And this you can do for each qubit individually and independently of each other. And then the question boils down for the, uh, like tuning the metadim devices really choosing which basis and which, uh, for which qubit and which basis to measure. So we, as input, again, on the pre-processing side, we have to find measurement settings, so which Pauli basis to measure in each of the qubit and uh, for each measurement round. And then on the post-processing side, of course, based upon these measurement settings, we have to give an estimator of the energy. And what we do um, is we work on both sides of this Around the experiment on the pre-processing side, we give an um, um, algorithm which uh, efficiently finds your measurement settings based on the Hamiltonian description in the Pauli decomposition, as well as we design an estimator, of course, upon choosing our measurement settings. And in particular, and this is our main result, we give you a guarantee, so a guarantee parameter epsilon, which is basically your uh, yeah, provable accuracy 
using those measurement settings that you have selected. In particular, we are looking here at this grouped estimator. That is, you estimate each of the Pauli observables individually, but what you observe is in your Hamiltonian, you have uh, many, ob commute, uh, many observables which commute among the, each other, right? So these could, in principle, be measured with the same measurement setting. And what this introduces into your correlator, uh, into, in, into your estimator, is our correlations, because you don't have any, in, uh, you don't have any more independent observables, uh, random variables in this decomposition here. And we deal with this uh, issue, and this is our main result. Um, we equip any measurement scheme, which, uh, yeah, which works on what I was, was just showing you. Um, we, we give measurements, uh, guarantees to this measurement scheme. So maybe let, let me walk you through. The first, you have the Hamiltonian. In the power decomposition, you have access to single copies of quantum state. Uh, this grouped energy estimator from the slide before. And then this NI basically counts how often you have compatible measurement settings that actually measure uh, compatible with the observable I, the ith observable in your decomposition. And then you assume that you at least found one measurement setting for each of them. And uh, yeah, then you redefine this H prime and some epsilon and then give you a tail bound to the uh, failure probability that your estimator is more than some epsilon away from the unknown target energy. And this holds really for any measurement scheme. Uh, and moreover, what you see here is you find this one norm of this vector H prime, and you can, we, we can actually relate this to a weighted power mean of degree minus one, ha one half of this, uh, of this vector here. Um, as a proof sketch, what we apply is uh, the vector Bernstein inequality, because as I was saying, the problem is we have correlations. We don't have independent uh, observables in our, in our estimator. Uh, independent random, var random variables in our de uh, decomposition. So we have to deal with this, and using the vector Bernstein inequality, we actually go from vector, uh, random variables to random vectors. And the good thing about this is because entries in a random vector don't need to be independent. And this is how we, uh, yeah, we rectify this issue. And uh, there is uh, vector Bernstein inequality in the literature, but it's formulated for two norms. And what, I see, what you've shown, I've shown you is formulated for the one norm, so we have to somehow first, in the first step, prove that we actually can go from this two norm of vectors to the one norm. And this we do by generalizing and then going back to the one norm. In particular, we go to random variables that take values in a separable Banach space, Banach space first, which might be of uh, separate interest uh, apart from, from, my, uh, from this topic here. And then as a special case, we can go back then to really to the one norm. Then we have to find these, uh, we have to construct suitable random vectors from the measurement settings. And then the last uh, step, we have to actually show that this is an, this there, there, the one norm is actually an upper bound to the uh, energy estimation accuracy which you want to achieve. What is also nice, as we now have a tail bound, we can actually have a look at the statistical estimator. And uh, what people usually do is and try to uh, to decrease the number of measurement rounds you have to do is basically truncate the Pauli decomposition here on the upper right. As basically you would throw away terms which are, might be not important because they don't have a small absolute value in, in terms of the coefficient hi. And what we actually can prove is with high probability we can give you a threshold value when it's beneficial or not to, to, to truncate. And then most importantly it's only depending on your inconfidence parameter delta and not on the uh, importance of the HI value and the coefficient in the Pauli decomposition. This, we, we show this by uh, yeah, writing down the systematic error plus a statistical error, which we have either by truncating or by keeping the statistical error, and then uh, yeah, finding the threshold value. And if we do a plot of this, so if you're below this orange line here, you would truncate the ith observable. If you're above, you would go with the statistical error. And you see that if you can go really to very small inconfidence levels, like really, really high probability, and the number of, uh, of uh, samples you have to take for this ith observable does not uh, explode too much. Um, another avenue which you could go is try to optimize now the measurement settings, and this is what we also uh, refer to optimize in optimizing a measurement scheme is. Uh, you want to optimize over this Pauli basis which you can choose, right, for each measurement round. Uh, however, we show that this optimization is NP-hard in the number of qubits, 
And this even holds if you only want to find a single next measurement setting. So even if, if I already several, uh, sampled for some time, and you ask me, Aki, can you give me one more, one more measurement setting than finding this best one, which optim uh, or minimizes the right-hand side uh, here, this is even uh, still NP hard in number of qubits. Um, the result is not too surprising because you know that this grouping into commuting families and trying to minimize the number of groups, of different groups, this is also an NP-complete problem. So actually we also show here that we, we actually find a reduction from grouping to our, to our problem, um, proving that the completeness here. And for the case for n equals one, we're only finding a single measurement setting, we go one step back to the underlying graph problem. This is the clique problem, find, trying to find the largest clique, uh, clique within a graph that's also com NP complete uh, and finish the proof finish the proof on this side. Um, now we turn to, I turn to uh, our algorithm. So what, what I've shown you is uh, MP completeness, so that uh, yeah, demands for heuristic approaches to find suitable measurement settings. We cannot hope to find the best measurement settings in the, yeah, in the worst case, but at least we could try to find at least suitable ones. And what we can actually try to minimize is this upper, this tail bound to the um, failure probability that we meet a certain precision epsilon. Because eventually if we uh, decrease this, it's an upper bound to the actual unknown uh, quantity we want to uh, minimize, this would also minimize the error we, we probably do. And this, you can convince yourself, this is equivalent to minimizing this one norm of this vector. Um, so effectively, you want to min uh, opt, uh, maximize these ni values here jointly. And here you see there's some, the commutativity structure is now not, not uh, openly apparent, but it's more somehow hidden in what values you can reach here with, for these ni's jointly. Um, and what you also see is that it's basically a summation over all the individual contributions for each of the Pauli observable, for each observable in the decomposition. Which is nice now because it implies an ordering of the observable with respect to their respective importance on our tail bound. And that's pretty cool now, we can actually order the observables on their importance, and this you can do quite efficiently computationally. Um, that's why we also put the word efficient in our title. Um, because you can com compare this to typical grouping algorithms, which at least have to make up the whole commutativity graph between every observable in the decomposition to any other. And this typically scales at least quadratically in the number of terms. And because the number of terms already scales to the, in quantum chemistry problems, to the fourth power of the number of qubits, this really is uh, uh, something you have to keep in mind, that this uh, is also a practical, practical improvement. Um, for our algorithm then, as I said, we can order the observables with some, with some weight here. Um, and I color coded now my, the, the observables, these are just example um, Pauli strings. And uh, with color coded are the non-identity terms, x, y, or z, and uh, white spaces are just identities in, a, in the Pauli strings. And uh, we find the next measurement setting as follows. We go with first with an idle measurement setting and see whether the current measurement setting we found, um, then go one by one through the list and see whether it commutes with the next uh, list, uh, element in the list of the observables. If it does, which it does here in this case, um, we fill up the non-identity uh, we fill up the non-identity spots um, in our measurement setting, and then we check for the next one. And in this case, it does not commute, so we discard it and don't change anything. And then we go on and on and on throughout the list until eventually you fill up everything here. And in this case, you see that, um, yeah, observable one, three, and four, and five would commute with each other, so you can measure them at the same time. And we found the co corresponding measurement setting for it. Now, really, uh, I want to convince you that our method called shadow grouping is really a combination of two prominent ideas. One is the classical shadow paradigm, which we already had quite a lot of talks here on this conference, which basically give you error control and a single individual Pauli observables, whereas these grouping techniques try to go, die, go and exp uh, exploit the commutativity structure in your Pauli decomposition. And we really, yeah, combine the, the best of both worlds. Um, and here, 
while being efficient. So we actually, we, we hide more or less the commutativity structure in our tail bound a little bit and design the algorithm such that it still finds efficiently, finds these uh, new measurement settings efficiently. Now for the last, last part of my talk, I want to show you some numerical results. So a typical numerical benchmark is uh, looking at the electronic structure problem of some small molecules. And for this, you readily obtain the, Ham Ham the fermionic Hamiltonian description. Um, there's a lot of libraries which actually do this. You just basically input your um, molecule configuration and spits you out the Hamiltonian. This we then map to the qubit Hamiltonian because we are considering qubit uh, Hamiltonians. For example, using, using jordan wigner trans uh, encoding, Bravi Kital for also the parity encoding. Then we fix the measurement budget to a 1,000 measurement settings each for, for any measurement scheme we want to run. Each of these settings which are then generated is only measured once uh, to yeah, get, uh, give an estimate of the, uh, um, of the energy and this absolute deviation here, this is what we report on the next slide and you will see a table popping up on the left. On the left column there is uh, there's the molecules in with different fermion to qubit mappings and per line, we compare per, per row, and the smallest value per row is highlighted in orange. And uh, this is in the table. The bigger left block is our method. We have several variants about it, and I can explain to you later if you want to know some more details on this. But what you see is that they typically outperform other state-of-the-art approaches, which are here, these other three methods on the right-hand side. Uh, for, for various different molecules and also very different uh, various values for qubits. I think these values here range from 10 to 14 qubits or so for these different molecules. Um, what we also did is uh, this kind of, this, uh, this truncation column here for shadow grouping is that you basically apply this truncation criterion after you've already uh, gone through allocating 1,000 measurements or finding 1,000 measurement settings, you could go through because this truncation criterion does not take into account any outcomes, right? You can just directly apply this truncation, throw away already those terms which you know you won't measure anyways many of, uh, much often. This gives you uh, eventually, uh, probably sometimes some more room to uh, get, yeah, to exchange these measurement settings to more informative ones. And we see that this sometimes improves quite a lot on the on the accuracy and sometimes it uh, fails horribly in the case of NH3, for example. Uh, so this really takes into account information from the outcomes, from the state. What we also can do is, when this is more the typical benchmark, is that you don't have, of course, the outcomes of the state, the, uh, yeah, the ground state also uh, available. Uh, what we still can do is to apply our tail bound um, because a tailbone only uh, requires a Hamiltonian and not the state itself uh, as of now. So you can also compare different measurement schemes compared uh, with the provable error, either statistical or systematical. And this, what, this is what you see here on, uh, on this benchmark. Because we give guarantees for any measurement scheme, this also works. We can also apply them to different state-of-the-art methods here in orange and gray. And if you don't truncate now our method, because it's a set in like an explorative mode if you go first through all observables. That's why this plateau extends a bit further out than the other methods. And then you, you see that the error decreases. But once you do the truncation after 1,000 1, measurement settings and rerun everything, this truncation is very, uh, yeah, computationally uh, very cheap, you see that you can yeah, dramatically reduce the error, especially for a finite uh, or smaller, smaller amounts of measurement settings more smaller measurement budget. And this is usually what you only have uh, given as a benchmarking tool. You don't have, uh, you don't have the full state or full, full state description available and eventually you have to only go with the provable error. And this, in this way, we are also state of the art. So maybe to uh, wrap up my talk, what I've showed you is that we are, shadow, shadow grouping provides you a state of the art measurement scheme that is trying to prepare suitable measurement settings for this, for this task. While also, we also provide the first energy estimation guarantees for these competitive measurement schemes. In particular, they, you have this grouped estimator, you have this correlation in your estimates, and uh, yeah, we can deal with this issue. And of course, you can see this as 
separate entities, but what we also see is there's a, a nice connection between the two ways, because if you want to optimize a guarantee promise, you end up with uh, very suitable measurement settings. And maybe for an outlook, what could be done in the future, what we are interested in doing in the future is that right now we don't do, we don't incorporate any empirical variance or covariance information from the outcomes. Um, this would be quite nice on one hand on the guarantee level, of course, but also on the, from the, for the measurement scheme because our scheme is already like an online algorithm. You, uh, you go through the measurement settings one by one, so it's very numerically very cheap to take the outcomes somehow into account. Um, of course, knowledge about the state, for like symmetry or purity, would also be nice. And lastly, we are also working on a directly fermionic uh, version, version for shadow grouping. Uh, yeah, with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you for the excellent talk. Are there any questions? I think there was something I didn't understand um, about the grouping the commutative observables together. Are you assuming that, like, that with, with your, like when you're evaluating your protocol, are you assuming you can measure all these commutative, commuting observables at the same time? Is that sort of the, one of the ideas? Yes, we can. So with all, we have this minimal um, setup or minimal requirement for the hardware that's very easy to go from, if you have all the commuting family, uh -huh. um, to go to the measurement setting because the, 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 what was actually spit out is basically a label for each qubit in which Pauli basis you have to measure. And this directly gives you a circuit which implements this. Yeah. What, 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 ha what, what happens if you don't want to do that? You could go to general commutativity relations. The guarantees still hold, of course. Um, usually you can group more and together because general, general commutativity, so what we are using here is a constrained version of commutativity relations called qubit-wise commutativity. And there's, of course, these general, general commutativity relations are much more general, but they require deeper circuits for their readout. Oh, I but see. But there are what methods. But there are methods to construct them. Yeah. Okay. So it's just a qubit-wise commutativity. Right now it's qubit-wise, but uh, uh, in general, better. everything here works with uh, general commutativity. Okay. I see. That's really good. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, nice talk. Um, I'm curious if there's a simple intuition for why the uh, truncation sometimes makes things so much worse. That seems very non-intuitive to me. Yeah, so um, if I go back to, my, to the truncation, you, what you see is you don't, you only consider, so, okay, the, the, the tail bound itself, but we, what we have to actually do is upper bound all variance information to the maximum. And this is usually not the case for any state of practical purpose, right? Usually you have less, where you don't maximize all Pauli observables, uh, maximize the variance of all Pauli observables in the decomposition. Right now we have to assume this for uh, proof purposes, but once you go to empirical variance or covariance information, I think this should be reflected in our bound here. Right now we don't do this, and that's why sometimes it, it's nice, sometimes it fails because you cut away the wrong things, basically. So uh, is it a right understanding of that, that just in the particular state, like the Pauli terms that you have thrown away are actually more important than some that you're keeping? No, I think just because uh, this is a worst case estimate on the uh, statistical error and uh, probably the statistic statistical error is much smaller if you have small variance, but we uh, treat it as if, if, it has, if it had maximal variance. Okay, thank so you. So you're cutting away the wrong things. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, hi, uh, Alexander, yeah, congratulations. That was really a fantastic talk and very strong results. Uh, this is now like an old guy question, but your algorithm reminds me a bit of like our de-randomization algorithm like two years ago, but it's much better. What did we overlook? Uh, okay, yeah, because now that's a good question because we already like we took your de-randomization paper a little bit as a starting point. Um, what you do is you enforce a qubit ordering. You have to say you go qubit by qubit through and of course, finding the right order does, should not make a difference, but it does, of course, on an algorithmic level. What we do is directly go to commutation relations because they are ordering invariant. And I think this gives us the edge here. Any more questions?
I have a small technical question. Um, can you give me the like one minute summary of getting from the one norm to the two norm in your proof? Ah, yes, sure. Um, so what is already formulated is the, the vector branch inequality for two norm. Um, what we figured out is that actually all the steps required for the proving, um, as, so they are, wait, maybe I've, yeah, they are a little bit already contained in this, uh, in this book, but a little bit hidden, but you could find all the ingredients to prove the more general stuff here um, for the separate Banner space directly in there. We, we just followed this, yeah, we filled these gaps. Uh, you can find this in the appendix um, of our paper. And then you, will, you see, okay, uh, I mean, vectors with, it's basically the L1, the L1 space is such a separable Banner space. So it's quite easy to follow this. And then we did only a small correction to it to, to improve the, the, the bounds a bit. Makes sense, thanks. I might ask a related question, just very simply. Uh, why was it important to move from the two norm to the one norm? Uh, that's important for step number three, because otherwise we are not, we don't really know how to relate uh, this lower quantity here to the to the norm. This more technical detail, probably you could also relate this if you're a bit cleverer than me, maybe to to the two norm, because this is a more uh, has maybe some more nicer properties. But uh, right now it's yeah. We formulated for the okay, thank you. Um, we might have time for one last question. Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Alex again for an excellent talk.